Hey everybody, it's Jason Ricks with the Liberty Fund and Jordan Steck. We're here to uh, talk with you all today. Very excited about the fund launch and we're looking at a property that we really love, a uh, tenant that we like and in a market that uh, we're, we're definitely having our eyes on and, and Jordan is extremely familiar with. So uh, with, without further ado, we wanted to kind of dive in and just have a, have a conversation about a property that we're looking at acquiring. All right, so Jordan was kind enough to put together a case study for us to review together, um, and hopefully we can bring a, a lot of value. We certainly feel that it will. And uh, so without uh, much uh, more conversation, Jordan, why don't you share with us why Aspen Dental, why Rock Hill, South Carolina, and, and, and just give us high level uh, what, what you liked about this deal. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jason, and, and thanks for teeing that up for me. So really what we're going to go through today is to give you a behind the scenes look at how we approach acquisitions, um, both from the property level and also from the fund analysis level, as those two things play kind of a symbiotic role um, in our investment process. So what we're going to look at today is an Aspen Dental located in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Um, and we'll go through a few different things about the area. So just hang on tight. So what we're going to go through today are the core factors that make a big implication on the feasibility of an acquisition, both from the property level all the way through to the fund level. Some items that we're going to talk about today and go through uh, on a finite level is the market and submarket research. Hugely important because a lot of our assumptions are going to be dictated by what's in the market today and what's going to be in the market tomorrow. We'll take a look at the property summary or the property overall the state of the building's condition. When was it built? We'll take a look at the nuts and bolts of the lease abstract that brings income to our fund and some of the other things that might implicate the assumptions that we're gonna be making in financial analysis. We'll look at the site plan review. And what I mean by this is we'll look at the, where specifically this is located. Is it located within a shopping center as an out parcel? Is it located on its own on a major highway? And this expands to the location itself and the economic development and market growth. Not only, again, like I said, what's here today and what's going to be here tomorrow, but what type of economic development is going to occur? Will there be more apartments coming into the submarket? Will there be more residential townhomes coming into the submarket? Will there be any other income drivers or economic development drivers that'll bring people to the submarket? We'll take a high level look at the asset class performance, specifically how this market is performing. We'll look at the tenant summary and the credit review because we know it's very important to understand who is signing the lease in our building and is there any risk involved in this specific tenant themselves. We'll look at the sales comparables to compare against what has been sold in the market over the last couple of years and where does our property compare based on our current underwriting assumptions. And then we'll get down very micro into the financial analysis and how we look at the numbers and what those numbers mean. Are they good? Are they bad? and what needs to happen for us to hit our specific yields. We'll also take a look at the portfolio and risk analysis. We'll see how the specific deal, if we do it, rolls up into the fund returns so that our investors can see, well, is this not only a good deal on the property level, but also does it make our fund better or is it within our strategy? As well as looking at risks involved in this transaction. If the market changes, will it still be a good deal? And if it does change, what do we need to do? Or what type of financing do we need to put in place to stay within our target return? So we'll start with the market and then we'll move on to the submarket. Uh, our property is located in Rock Hill, South Carolina, which is about 20 miles south uh, via the major Interstate 77 that connects North Carolina to South Carolina. While it's not in the same state, it houses the same favorable tax advantages. Uh, and one of the big things that we're seeing and why we like these states and these uh, markets in our fund strategy is because of this net migration patterns from north to south. In fact, Charlotte is in the top 10, well, the top two really, of net migration from 2010 to 2018, where it saw 71% increase in net migration uh, over those eight years. And I want to stop Jordan and say, you know, I've, I've mentioned this a few times on, on other podcasts and, and during our we other webinars. What's so critical about this is the individual buildings that we're acquiring. These are essential services. And what's going to drive their sales and the health of these locations 
is population increases. And so we want to be in areas that are growing, not only now, but for the next decade, because the more people in any given market, the more they're going to need these services. Everyone's going to need to go to the dentist. And so this is really, really critical to our fund strategy. So we'll go down now on a more micro level in the specific submarket, which is Rock Hill, South Carolina. I really, really like um, not just the state of South Carolina, but this area just south of Charlotte for quite a few different reasons. Jason had just mentioned the emphasis we put on uh, popula population growth um, over a course of you know, 10, 20 years and where we think it's going to be going. This specific submarket uh, has seen an annualized population growth over 10, 14, 15 years of 2.6%, which is pretty healthy. And not only that, it has three different major colleges in the area, which include Winthrop University, York Technical College, and Clinton College, which is something like 26,000 plus students within just a six mile radius to the subject property. The household income shows good fundamentals, well, below, well above the United States average at $82,000 per annum in a five mile radius. And Jordan, you know, this number is, is just so critical. Sorry to jump in. Sure. 82,000, I, I think I just want to reiterate this. That is way above national average. Mm -hmm. This is extremely healthy. So imagine a, a circle around our, our property that we're looking at acquiring within a five mile radius. 82,000 household income is great. And that's right in line with the target demographic that Aspen Dental wants to get. And then uh, Jordan touched on this. Look, each one of these markets has to have um, a healthy economy and you want diversity in a healthy economy. Having these access to, you know, really top end colleges, all different types of colleges too. Uh, again, great, creates a ton of room and expansion for this, for this individual market. So uh, it's one that, that we really like, not only for the population growth, but for the diversity of it and then the health of the households. Yeah, exactly. And, and the last point I'll make here on, on the submarket um, is the area schools. There's 27 area schools that uh, services 25,000 students from elementary to middle middle school, uh, which would insinuate that there's a very large amount of uh, families in this area. What's good for us, not just because of investment fundamentals in a submarket, but because Aspen Dental is a family dentist practice, that's the type of demographic that you want to see in a submarket. So one of the other big important things is to take a look at the property summary and to abstract the lease. And what I mean by that is to take a look at the specific things inside of the lease that are going to materially impact your operations if you buy the property and your financial analysis. So this property is an Aspen Dental. It's 3,500 square feet. It's a new build, which is really interesting uh, because sometimes those can get a little pricey, but we might've got a little lucky here. Uh, the lease term is 10 years, which is extremely healthy and puts a lot less risk on us having to uh, renegotiate a lease or try to get a renewal. Uh, and essentially not, if they don't renew, they're gonna have a dark box and will essentially be in quite some trouble. Uh, so in this case, we have a long-term lease. Another thing is the escalations. A lot of times leases will have an annual increase or they'll have an increase every five years. In this case, it's a 10% increase every five years, which equates to uh, an effective annual increase of 2%, which is still pretty healthy. A lot of leases that you see sometimes will have 5% every five years um, and so on and so forth, but we, we like what we have here. Because it's a new build, the renewal options are pretty expansive. There's three renewal, three five-year renewal options. So that gives us an extra potential 15 years on the lease, bringing the life of the, uh, the specific property to 25 years. So that gives a little bit reassurance to the next buyer that this property could be a more a long-term investment for them as well. Now, inside of our fund strategy and why we're specifically targeting this asset class is because of their specific uh, payment of the operating expenses. During this, or in this lease, I should say, the common area maintenance, the taxes, and the insurance, which are massive line items for any commercial real estate property, are being paid by the tenant directly, which minimizes 
a lot of overhead for the landlord. The only thing that the landlord will be responsible for is going to be the roof and structure, which is typical for a new build, especially since this was 2021. But for us, the good news is, is that the roof is typically going to have 20 year life lifespan. So we won't have to uh, most likely shell out a lot of cash for that as well as the structure. And then one of the last and most important things is who's guaranteeing the lease. So if for some reason Aspen Dental uh, went out of business and, or the owner of that Aspen Dental uh, went bankrupt, it's guaranteed by the actual corporation who owns Aspen Dental. So if they were to go bankrupt, to terminate their lease uh, or whatever, however that situation might work out, the Aspen Dental corporate would be backing the money that they would owe us for the life of their lease. And there's, there's so many good things here that I want to unpack. And, and first, this is a broad, broad stroke summary. Okay, so these are some of the main key points. There's a lot more nuance to the lease that we're going to keep out for today's webinar, which we can get into on further ones. Um, Jordan hit on so many really good highlights, but strategically, if I'm an investor, what gets me excited about this deal? Well, I, I have got a few. One, when do we want to sell this property, Jordan? Look, we've got this really great rental increase after year five, right? That's a pretty significant uptick in rent. If I did some back of napkin math, that rental increase from year five to year six increases in a Y pretty substantially. That adds, for my math, roughly around 230,000 in value. So two strategies for the investor out there. One, we could look at selling this asset after it's been bumped up in year six in rent, or we could hold it for the life of this term, right? The entire 10 years and be a really good landlord to Aspen Dental get them to renew their lease early, right? With that new increase in NOI and rental and then bring it to the market. And there's still meat on the bone for the next landlord. That's so critical. You don't wanna squeeze all the juice out of these properties. You wanna leave enough meat on the bone to where the next guy can make his next profit. Now yeah. that to me, so we have optionality. I love that aspect of this property. Secondly, you get a corporate guarantee. So they're owned by this huge, large private equity company. They're going to probably go, Jordan, I, I'm seeing um, most news outlets now saying they'll probably go for an IPO here pretty soon. They've acquired a really nice um, braces company, the not the Avisaline, but another group very similar to them. And they've got great credit by, you know, S&P. So mm -hmm. uh, with this being a new build also, look, the roof, I, you know, I want to be, if you take, if you take, really good care of your properties, this roof will not be, need to be replaced within the primary term. It's usually going to be about a 15-year roof issue. There may be some very, very minor repairs, but because it's so new on construction, we still have the warranty on that roof for a period of time, which, is, which puts us in a really good position. And as Jordan put perfectly, the maintenance on the building, the taxes, and the insurance get passed through to the tenant. So we have this very, very true predictable level of income coming to us as investors in the form of cash flow. And then we have two exit strategies. And I like, honestly, Jordan, I like both of them. I don't know what you feel. What do you think? Would you want to hold this for the entire 10 year and, and try to get them to exercise their option? Or would you think you would want to sell it after year six with that first bump? Well, it all depends what the market looks like at that, at that point in time. Um, and one of the reasons why we run two or three different scenarios when we're looking at an acquisition. But very well, in both situations, that can be a huge upside, um, either six or 10 years, because the next buyer is going to be getting an additional 10% increase uh, in the next five years, given that the tenant has renewed when we uh, pre-negotiate uh, a renewal. And that, that's a perfect answer by Jordan. And so, you know, Jordan's a very sharp guy, so he gets it. It's, it's all about the market. Right, so if the market's perfect for an, for us to sell this asset in year six or seven, let's do it. Uh, if it's not favorable, we can be patient and hold. Right, Jordan. Right, we could hold it, yeah. still cash flow it really well, and then look at our options in year ten. Right, right, and I'll also add to that too. If you if you think about this from uh, an inflationary standpoint, when you have lease structures like this, not only is your lease increasing uh, every five years or in this case, 2% effective uh, annually. 
that can taxes insurance and other lease structures that you would have to pay that plus the inflation on those costs, let's say two to two and a half percent, you're actually getting all of the, the increase on, on the two percent. So now we'll get down even more micro. We started with the market, we went to the submarket. Now we're going to look at the specific property and its surrounding, uh, surrounding sites. So this specific site is an out parcel to the gro a grocery anchor Cherry Road Shopping Center, specifically Publix, which is a great grocery store. I'm not sure if you've been there. Um, it's pretty popular in the Southeast. Um, more, I would say, close to a, a Whole Foods-ish style grocery. And also, Jordan, can I stop you really quick? Sure. You talked about a technical term on out parcel. Can, yeah. you help, can you help the investor understand what an out parcel is? Yeah, so typically at a uh, traditional shopping center, you'll have uh, a grocery store, you'll have you know, four, five, six, seven tenants like uh, T-Mobile, Sally Beauty in this case. And the property overall itself is going to have a little bit of extra land on it that you're going to, a lot of owners are going to want to optimize, right, from, a, from a, an income standpoint or an investment standpoint. In this case, that piece of land can be developed on and also then called an out parcel. So our investment in this case is gonna be an out parcel to uh, the shopping center that houses the gross ranker uh, Publix. Perfect, and, and you know what makes me really giddy as an investor? You know what makes me very happy, Jordan, is looking at that beautiful lit intersection right there, your little icon right next to our building. You know, I love that the access is great. You're not having to scream in and turn in last second. You've got a nice corner intersection. Um, you've got people that can turn in. You have great access. And then the other thing that gets me excited is, you know, you reference out parcels. Well, this is on the busiest intersection, right? I mean, look at Cherry Road. You get almost 40,000 vehicles per day. The population is growing. That's a ton of cars. I mean, literally, they're going to see that Aspen Dental every day to work, every time they go and get their groceries. And you undersold Publix. Publix is the best grocery store in this market, okay? So Publix is the number one. If you're from Texas, it's HEB. If you're in the Southeast, it's Publix. And so us being located next to the best grocer in the Southeast all day long, lit intersection, the real estate there gets me more excited than the tenant and the tenant's terms, Jordan, because it's yeah. what we could do with that piece of land. Even if Aspen Dental goes away, which they won't, Right. I'm, I'm time stamp that. I'm okay with that. But that piece of real estate is phenomenal. Right. All the vehicles, lit intersection, right next to the best grocery store. Think of all the vehicles they bring per day. Right. Um, it, so I, I think it's a phenomenal site. I think you did a great job finding this one. Uh, but uh, I'm cutting you off. So keep going with your, with your summary here. No, you, you hit the next, the next biggest point here is the visibility factor. I mean, think about this. Think about 39,000 vehicles getting stopped. Well, maybe not, but if it's a, if it's a good intersection, they're going to be stopping at a red light right next to an Aspen Dental with an access road directly into the entire shopping center itself. That's incredible visibility for the tenant. It makes it an attractive site for this tenant. And like you said, uh, they might stay here, but if they don't, the reason we like these types of out parcels in that location is because when a tenant goes back on site and we re release this bad boy at market for market rents, they're going to be like, wow, there's 39,000 people that are going to see this every day. So let's, let's broaden out. We've, we've gone from top to bottom. Let's go back towards the top and, and take it out into an aerial. Just this picture alone, if you just look at it, where the Aspen Dental is lo located in the, I would say this is about a three mile radius, is surrounded by an incredible amount of retail. In this case, these are all extremely synergistic because most people aren't going to stop at one store when they go out. Typically, they're making two or three stops. In this case, they could go to the Publix, right? That's fine. Or they can go to the gym down the street, or they can go to the Verizon store just north and what we like to call this is the retail nexus. This is a really important uh, location to be in when you're looking for specific properties because of the synergistic co-tenant environment that's created 
with these cross, with the ability for these folks to, to cross shop. And, and fact, here's here's well, what I, I see. Here's what I see, Jordan. Sorry to cut you off. I, no, I'm, go ahead. Sorry to stress this, but I see the best grocery store in the submarket. We beat the location for Walmart. We beat the location for Food Lion. Mm -hmm. We also have the best gym uh, brand in the submarket, right? We have, this is not the YMCA. This is not Planet Fitness. We have Gold's Gym right there in, in the shopping center as well, generating a ton of traffic. Uh, we have some of the best brands along this intersection and road on Cherry Road. Then, mm -hmm. you know, again, we're at a hard lit intersection. So um, I get excited because I get to see the households around this immediate pocket of retail, which is what it's all about, right? We Rooftops, you know, retail is going to follow rooftops. So if we've got a location for an Aspen Dental, we want as many rooftops that are healthy with household income as possible in the most competitive shopping center area. And that's what we have here. So yeah, exactly. Again, when you pull it all the way out, you know, I've looked at enough of these that's what gets us really excited. For example, if this location was further north uh, next to Goodwill and Food Line, I, I wouldn't be as excited, right? So that, that Walgreens location further up there, if you can keep everyone at, at home, keeping track of this off of uh, 161, that's a decent intersection, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of national, you know, freestanding drive-throughs, et cetera. But I, I think our location is far superior. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And, and with location uh, comes arterial access to major highways, as we mentioned before, because this, this city itself in this location is right off of I-77, which is a major highway. It's only 20 miles away from a major city that is Charlotte that houses a ton of, uh, ton of jobs, right? So it's easy to say that a, that a person can live out here in a much more quiet residential area and not have the buzz of the city, but be close enough to be getting into, into Charlotte itself. So let's look at a little bit more of the demand drivers around in and around uh, our subject property. Just to the east of it, and I, I know Jason's a huge football fan, that uh. the Carolina Panthers uh, NFL sports team is just invested a billion dollars to recreate their new practice facility and headquarters. That's going to bring attraction to the submarket as well as employment, and is also oh, going to be huge. delivered in 2023. So we buy this thing right by the end of the year. Two years down the line, we've got a fully operational NFL practice facility and headquarters. Next buyer says, "I think I can pay a little bit extra to be in, in a really popular submarket." And not only that, the, the residential areas, as we'll talk about in a few slides from now, will also grow around that because of the attraction. Yeah, no, Jordan hit the nail on the head. Again, this goes back to a theme that you'll hear us talk about a lot. We're looking for areas that are getting better over the years because, you know, rising tide is going to lift all boats. And if, if we're in a really good area that's growing and developing and bringing more bodies, good demographics, that's where we want to be. So when I see this slide, I look at all the multifamily development. I look at all the single family. Yeah. I look at the Carolina Panthers. I just think of one thing. I think of growth. Yeah, I think you hit the, the, the nail on the head there, Jason, with growth uh, as, the, as the buzzword for this slide. Because if you look around this area and you look at the residential uh, that's impacting this, this retail center, there's almost 1,300 multifamily units within three miles. That is a ton of... That is a ton of apartment units. That's almost like a, like an urban core-esque uh, submarket, realistically, which is great. So just to reiterate, this is the concept of the new Carolina Panthers HQ and practice facility, which gets me really excited. Just the design of it, you're going to be able to see from the highway, and you're going to say as you're driving along with your family, well, I one, I wonder what that is, and two, where can I build my house or what apartment complex can I move into so I can be close to all of these uh, attractions themselves? Yeah, no, these guys, the Carolina Panthers ownership, just again, they're not building in a market that's not going to be great. That's not going to be growing, right? This will be a huge attraction. It'll be a huge driver to the local economy here. I, again, 
finding locations that are going to be better for the years to come. So this definitely checks those boxes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we were saying that this is going to drive more residential or more consumers for, for the Aspen Dental. One is the River Walk development, which is set to come into the market within five years. That's going to be 850 single family residences, 250 townhomes, and 550 multifamily units. So doing quick math there, that's 1,650 new residential homes that are coming into the market. So that brings the, that's almost 100% or more of the current stock of residential. Imagine the amount of consumers that, you know, Aspen Dental is excited to get when you increase a residential inventory by over 100%. Yeah, no, I mean, Jordan, you could replay that over and over again. That, that is such a good thing to highlight to people. And look at all the amenities that this development's gonna bring to the community. As someone with a family, um, yeah, I look at that and I go, I'm tickled to death to have those things in my backyard for my kid to enjoy, my family to enjoy. This will be a big, big uh, development for this area along with the Carolina Panthers practice facility. It, it, I just see this nothing but good things for this market over the next decade. Yeah, exactly, Jason. And they're even, the, the Carolina Panthers um, brought in some money as well to help the local economy. And a lot of times developers, when they enter market, the, the local municipality will require some sort of what are called proffers. And these proffers will require uh, then the developer essentially to build something like what you'll see here, the Rock Hill Outdoor Center, that creates more livability and amenities to the community itself. So another huge important thing that Jason had mentioned this a couple of times, so thank you, Jason, for bringing this up early um, to get his cooking, is the credit of a tenant. Now, Aspen Dental themselves, it's a private company, right, with uh, about 900 location. And as a comparison to this, let's just take Rite Aid, for example, who's public and has almost 2,500 uh, uh, locations. Aspen Dental themselves were founded a little bit, a uh, little bit later than Rite Aid for, for this example uh, in 98. And they've got two different ratings here, the S&P rating of a B and then Moody's rating of a B2. What that corresponds to is what they would call a default rate or the probability that this, at this company would default when it's liabilities. And in this case, for the comparison purposes, Rite Aid, for example, has 868, 842, which is somewhere in the ballpark of five to 6% higher than our Aspen Dental. So when we're looking at our fund strategy or on the property level, we say to ourselves, okay, well, who is gonna have you know, the least amount of, uh, of risk involved with the overall company? Because remember, we do have a corporate guarantee, so we wanna make sure that the corporation itself is pretty healthy. And so you could say that uh, the ratings here reflect that the companies that have a strong market position um, and they are the second largest dental service organization behind Heartland Dental. But we also have to be risk adverse and understand that you know, their, their rating could reflect that they have a high financial leverage or a high amount of debt and they're growing it at such a, a fast pace with 70 to 80 new offices opening per year that that could hurt their profitability margins also. So we must monitor, um, we must monitor kind of where the company is and how fast they're growing to make sure that we're taking the appropriate steps in case we need to begin to move into a, a releasing thought uh, phase. However, we believe at this point in time and for the foreseeable future that they're gonna be a credit worthy tenant in this case. No, that's absolutely right. And um, look, you know, Aspen Dental Management is, is, the, is the parent company behind this. Um, they are owned by a very, very large private equity company. Uh, to Jordan's point, they are growing rapidly. They're making acquisitions uh, at this time. We see no signs of them slowing down. And uh, here's the other thing that I love, not only the credit behind them and, and the risk or probability of default, which is extremely low. Ask any broker. I used to be one. Ask any broker what their favorite product is to release. And nine times out of 10, Jordan, what do they say? Second generation dental space. Yep, absolutely. So, yeah, 
I say this and I, I say this and I'm, and I'm not joking. I, sometimes I'm almost rooting for tenants not to make it because I know the market will yield a higher rental rate, which would increase the value of the property. Second generation dental space is so important because the infrastructure, just the ca it's so capital intensive to get these spaces suitable for a dental practice. And once you have the infrastructure there, it becomes extremely desirable. So even if, okay, let's play worst case, worst case scenario, Aspen Dental defaults year seven, there's an extremely high probability we'd be able to lease it to either uh, another dental practice of equal or greater credit worth and also equal or greater rental rates, which is something that, again, looking at worst case scenario, we have to from that lens at all times. But even with that being said, the probability of default on this one is so low. Uh, we like the, the com we like Aspen Dental Management. Uh, we have no issues with the parent companies. And, and ultimately, I think they're going to be going for an IPO here, Jordan, in the upcoming years. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, it gives them a little more liquidity and a little bit more uh, backing um, to stay to stay in business and keep paying the rent. And, uh, and, and, and transparency too, right? You know, the other thing I love about having publicly traded companies is, you know, when people ask me, what's the credit behind them? Well, shoot, let's, let's look at it together. Let's open up the financials. Right. Yep. Pull the, pull the 10Q and, and get to read, right? Yeah, absolutely. So let's take a look now at the sales comparables, specifically in this market. We like to look at this in, in two ways. We like to look at some of the bottom of the market deals and some of the top at market deals. You've already seen one of these or heard us talk about one of these right across the street from our subject property at the Publix. So if you take a look at this screen, you're going to see essentially that the bottom of the market, like a Verizon store or, or a restaurant quality tenant, is going to be trading around the nature of four, it looks like about $400 a foot, where the top of market is trading at eight, 880. And our subject property is trading just around even between the bottom and the top of the market. Now, what that says to us is one, we're not overpaying for the, for the market itself. And two, there's a little meat on the bone for the next buyer to say, oh, wait a minute, I think that this property has moved to top of market as the, as the, uh, as the submarket grows in general and gets even more better fundamentals, it can now be sold for you know X amount more, inclusive of the rent escalations. So we're comfortable here saying, okay, we pay 641 a foot because it's right in the middle of the market and we can justify this. And keep in mind, too, for everyone watching out there, you've got brand new construction in Aspen Dental. You've got the best grocery store here. Uh, also, when I look at the Pizza Hut and the Verizon buildings that are at the bottom of the market, that's older construction, right? We don't know, we don't know the lease term associated with Pizza Hut or Verizon. And yep. more, we don't know the rent. Maybe those deals were entered into in 2008 with really, really low rent, or maybe there's no rent growth at all. Right. So there's, there's a lot of nuance to it. So you can't just look at things on a per square foot basis. There's a lot of detail that goes into some of these, but clearly I'd rather own brand new construction uh, in the best uh, particular area within the submarket backed by Publix, which is right behind me, the best chain for, for a grocery store in this area. So let's get into the financial analysis. Some of my, my favorite parts, Jason knows that I'm, I'm a real, uh, Real uh, financial analysis um, uh, addict, if you will. Don't don't put anyone to sleep, Jordan. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to make this as, as fun as I can, as numbers can be. Uh, so, the reason we we do this at last is because in order to make to do a financial analysis, you need to know the reasons for making assumptions, whether it be cap rates, whether it be the acquisition price uh, in a market, the growth that you can anticipate in the market. Uh, so on and so forth is why we do this uh, last again. So in this case, we're going to be buying this property for $2.2 million or 641 as you saw before uh, a foot with our acquisition fees uh, at 4%. Now, typically you're going to see these between the one to two and a half percent range for larger deal sizes uh, because of the size of this deal. It typically is a little, it's a little closer to that 4% mark. Uh, and we also build in some contingency there just in case there is some increases 
during due diligence that we're going to have to cover that weren't we weren't able to anticipate uh, when we are deciding during our study period uh, if we're going to officially close on the deal or not. For the purposes of the analysis and to take a high level look at what our returns could be uh, is we're going to do a 10 year hold period because like we said before, we could view it in six years and do a refinance or we can hold, but in the, the off chance we do hold it for 10 years, we want to know what those returns are going to be. Our going in, going in cap rate at this point is going to be 637. Uh, for the purposes of being conservative, we're going to do uh, absolutely flat uh, cap rate growth. So it's going to be zero basis points over the life of the uh, investment period. And so our terminal cap rate is going to be about 6.37%. It could be a scenario where that uh, cap terminal cap rate or, go, or sale cap rate is going to be up, increase or decrease, but we'll take a look at what that sensitivity looks like in just a little bit. Yeah, and it's it's important. We take this very conservative. Again, we're ultimately very very conservative. Look, we don't anticipate having that many closing costs or acquisition due diligence fees, but we want to bake it in there just in case. And and we're we're also we've also been around the block a few times. I think anyone that's anticipating a reduction in cap rate, um, one, you have to be looking at like doing a significant value add play, Jordan, which forcing the appreciation of that asset. Yeah, absolutely. Some kind of new development where you're adding substantial value because in today's market, if you're buying with a tenant in place, I think it's irresponsible for us to look at where the 10 year is that we talked about earlier, the 10 year treasury and where cap rates at today, pretty historically low on that 10 year. So I don't wanna anticipate a whole bunch of reduction in cap rate, which would boost the price. So that's the way we look at each deal. It needs the pencil with no, with, with no better position than cap rate. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and so where we're gonna be going out in terms of the sale price is gonna be 2.7 million. That is attributable all the way 100% to the income and the increases that are already scheduled uh, as it is to the lease. Now, just the discount rate I'll, I'll talk about on the next slide, but for now we'll take a look at our financing assumptions. The market today for a single asset like this will dictate uh, an interest rate of 350 basis points fixed at 10 years, over 30 years of amortization. In this case, we could get uh, interest only on our note but for the sake of getting a lower principal balance on exit and also for being conservative, we're gonna go with zero here. Uh, we're also gonna be levering up at 70%. That is our fund maximum. Uh, so we're gonna plug that in here as well. So all in all, with debt considered, we're gonna be levered at 70% and that's gonna to equate to an equ total equity required of 683K. So let's jump into what we really want to know, and that's the summary of returns. So I will I'm going to preface this by saying that we have a fund level uh, target return that we look at also on the property level. So when you see this pretty green on the right hand side, or green meaning go, it's because the return metrics for our specific property have reached the threshold that the fund requires. In this case, an unlevered IRR of seven, a free and clear return of six, a levered IRR of 12, and a cash and cash yield of 8%. Yeah, so that's really, you know, green for go, red for stop. I mean, this is kind of our, our health test, isn't it, Jordan? If yeah, it, exactly. This is this is a... If we like the location, if we like the credit of the tenant, the deal itself, which is the most important piece, then we break it into the financials. We look at it conservatively. And if it matches our metrics to move forward, we do it. And if it doesn't, we have to reevaluate or let that one go. Yep, exactly. And so... If you look here on the right side, it is green because our unlevered IRR on a monthly basis is 7.22% and 6.27% for our free and clear return, which breaches our threshold. And on a levered Jordan, basis, yeah, go ahead. Before you keep going, let me let me ask you a question for all of us, all of us people out there. Un, can you explain to me what unlevered IRR and levered IRR is? And some sure. of these, some of these, what is M, uh, EMX? Sure. So your unlevered IRR, your internal rate of return, is your total return where the essentially your growth uh, in the investment over the life of your investment period, to say it in very layman scale, or layman terms, I should say. Your equity multiple is a ratio 
of the profits that you've made over your initial investment. So in this terms, without any debt, right? We just buy the property all cash and we don't place any debt on it to use our own, our own income or net income stream to pay the, the debt service, right? These are the returns that we would get. Now, on a lever basis, right? That's your revenue minus your OPEX, minus your capital expenditures, like roof and structure that we might have to pay down the line, as well as taking away the monthly or annual debt service payments that you have to make against your net income. And that's your levered IRR. So the whole point of using debt is to minimize the amount of equity that's required to place in one deal so that you can diversify appropriately. Uh, and two, pay, to use the properties or the tenant's cash flows to pay the, the debt service itself. So that's why you see a, a larger levered return here. So it's a mechanism that allows you to get more for, for your money. And I just want to reiterate the EMX, that is a multiple of what you originally invested. So if I invested 50 or $100,000, you take that and times it by the EMX number, that gives you your total return on this asset. And the IRR is the rate of return over the life of this investment, which is 10 years. So I use that as a metric against, okay, would I wanna own stocks for the next 10 years? Do I think it's gonna return, you know, under the leverage IRR 13.47? Uh, do I think my bonds are gonna give me 13.47? Uh, or do I think my higher risk or lower risk uh, assets are gonna generate that and you weigh the pros and cons as an investor? So that's what I really use those metrics for. Is that what you were referring to, Jordan, when you were saying it? Yeah, that is correct. And one more thing that we look at is we also take into consideration the actual um, net present value based on our cost of capital. Uh, and so in this case, what that's saying is um, what we would pay today to get a specific return as a cost of placing debt and also placing equity. And so in this case, our acquisition price, our net present value is actually um, or our purchase price is lower than that, which is great. If I'm an investor and I'm looking at this, I'm looking at my equity multiple, my leveraged internal rate of return and my average cash on cash return, that would get me pretty excited because there's, again, the default risk is so low. The, the requirements on roof repair is so low on a brand new building. And again, the location is, is phenomenal. So all of those returns would, would help me sleep at night. So here's the big thing. It might look good on the property level. However, we have, you know, we're going to have somewhere 30, 35 properties that all of the income soaks up or filters up into the entire fund. So it may be a deal that looks good on the property, but is it accreted with the fund's returns itself? So we put this through what's called uh, our, I guess, our fund level or portfolio level approval. And what we do is we take a look at all of our fund metrics and we put this deal into our fund and we analyze what that new deal is going to do to our fund. So in this case, we've actually uh, essentially increased the amount of projected 10-year NOI. We've actually increased our year 10 yield on cost We've increased our projected IRR on an unlevered and levered basis, as well as our equity multiple or EMX, as Jason mentioned, also our net profit. It has also decreased our blended interest rate from a total portfolio perspective, as well as some other key metrics to say, well, this deal actually increases the profitability or attractiveness of the fund as a whole. So we look at on a deal specific level, go or no go, does it match our metrics? And then we put it into the fund metrics and go, okay, is this good for the overall health of the fund? Correct. Yes. Because at the end of the day, as an investor, you're getting the culmination of all of these different assets. So you're getting the advantage of different income streams coming from different sub markets 
coming from different tenants and you're getting the ultimate culmination of, of what diversification is in, in a commercial real estate fund. So we mentioned before sensitivity analyses uh, and I'll keep this high level not to bore you, but what's really important on a deal level is to look at the sensitivity of your returns to changing variables. Because we know in the real world, it might look good on paper, but what happens if I can't live up to, or I can't get what I thought was going to be in the, in the financial analysis itself? In this case, we're looking at a sensitivity to a change in our leverage and a change in our interest rate. So we know that in this case, and you'll see in green here, that these are all of the going in assumptions or the leverage and the interest rate that we can get to achieve our required return for the fund. So in this case, if we actually decrease our leverage to 65% from 70, our return will move down 110 basis points or so, but still be within uh, our required return. If the interest rate moves multiple basis points, right, all the way to the right or all the way to the left in our circled red areas, which is our current return, we say that, oh, wow, we can actually get quite a few different interest rates and this deal will still pencil for us. It's a, this is a great tool for us because what this is going to do is this is going to help us evaluate where do we think interest rates are going to go in the future? What if, what if a bank was only willing to give us 60% LTV, Jordan, in five years from now because the market wasn't favorable? Where are we going to be positioned as a fund for that individual asset? Right. This helps us give us a real quick glance at, okay, what are, where, are, where are we going to be in trouble hypothetically? Now, interest rates today are historically low, and we don't see those changing anytime for the next you know, 12 to 18 months based on Fed guidance. So we're well within these thresholds. I'm more concerned what's going to happen five years from now, 10 years from now. And this gives us a chance to kind of play around with these metrics. And so it doesn't stop there. We also look at a, a, a few different things. Let's say we're taking a look at, we go into a deal and the broker comes to us and says, this is where we think the property is going to trade at. Now, it's a super attractive property, so we can assume if that's the case, that there's going to be other buyers trying to bid on this deal. So we need to know as, as principals, how much and what do we need to change to make sure that we can build, bid the max that we can without going over our required returns. Because if the deal, if we don't get this deal at our required or maximum acquisition cost, uh, then we go to ourselves and say, hey, this isn't a good deal for our investors from a fund perspective or a deal level perspective. I think we need to pass on it and we need to keep looking for good deals. So in this we case, need, if we, we need these principles as guidance, right, Jordan? I mean, that, that's the other thing I keep going back to. Like, we have to be extremely disciplined in our right. decision making. And the way we can do that is, is, is taking the emotion out of it and looking at rule-based investment metrics like this. Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple math, guys. I mean, if, if, it, if it pencils, great. If it meets the objectives, great. If it doesn't, we got to let it go. Let someone else overpay for it. Right, Jordan? I mean, that's kind of the way I look at it. It's just, it's, it's rule-based investing. Take the emotion out. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And this tool helps us really take a look at, well, if we have to pay an extra $50,000 or $100,000 for this asset, what do we have to do from a financing perspective uh, or other performance metrics in order to hit our required returns. And, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll thank you for your time and sitting with us to go through how we look at an acquisition uh, from the property level to the fund level and what excites us about or what's really important to us about each individual deal. Yeah, and we, you know, we can't thank you enough. We, we love adding value and, and free content out there for interested investors. Uh, we're super excited about the launch of the fund, the idea of, of not only owning this Aspen Dental, but imagine a portfolio full of these types of assets with rules-based investing in growth markets for the next decade. That's what gets us so excited and, and why we personally have invested you know, the lion's share of our net worth into this investment vehicle because we just believe in it. We think it's uh, the most stable and secure uh, asset class and, you know, 
filling a portfolio of brands that you know and trust and getting monthly income, I, I can't think of a better combination. So thank you again for your time. If you'd like to uh, reach out to us directly, feel free to reach out to myself, Jason Ricks at jason at libertyfund.io or Jordan Steck at jordan at libertyfund.io. And as always, feel free to visit our website at libertyfund.io for additional educational content. Thanks, everyone.